Hello and welcome to the Town Hall. Today is but one installment in a series entitled Century of Story and Song. The Town Hall was founded in 1921 by a group of suffragists who wanted the space to be a home to adults' education, consciousness raising, and civil discussion. Over the course of the next 100 years, many people came to the hall, many musicians came to the hall, and made the hall's acoustics world-renowned. Isaac Stern, Nina Simone, Bob Dylan, and many more made important debuts that changed the course of music history. Today, however, we continue our four-part series on the little-known history at the town hall, live comedy. Comedians came to the town hall, including Dick Gregory, the subject of tonight's program. Here to speak with us about the incredible Dick Gregory is Mark Anthony Neal. Mark Anthony Neal is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of African and African American Studies at Duke University and serves as the chair of the department. He's the founding director of the Center for Arts, Digital Culture, and Entrepreneurship at Duke University, where he offers courses on Black masculinity, popular culture, and digital humanities, including signature courses on Michael Jackson and the Black performance tradition, and the history of hip hop, which he co-teaches with Grammy award-winning producer Ninth Wonder. He also co-directs the Duke Council on Race and Ethnicity. Neil is the author of several books, including What the Music Said, Black Popular Music and Black Popular Culture, a Black Public Culture, excuse me, Soul Babies, uh, Black Culture and the Post-Soul Aesthetic, and Looking for Leroy, Illegible Black Masculinities. Uh, the 10th anniversary edition of Neil's New Black Man was published in February 2015 by Rutledge. Neil is co-editor of That's the Joint, the Hip Hop Studies Reader, now in its second edition. Additionally, Neil is the host of the video webcast Left of Black, which is produced in collaboration with the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke. You can follow him where I follow him on Twitter at, at New Black Man. Thank you so much for joining. Hey. Hi, can you hear now? Yes, I can hear now. <laughs> That's great. How well, are you today? I missed that great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I sang your praises, you know, just mentioned the Gregory briefly. <laughs> um, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm excited to do this. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, obviously, He's always really important to talk about, but I think definitely in the last uh, year or so, he's been circulating around the internet more, people looking at his speeches, looking at some of his comedy, and of course, now um, there is the documentary now on Showtime, the one and only Dick Gregory. Yes. So important to talk about him. First things first, when did you first encounter Dick Gregory? What was your first memory of his work or anything like that? You know, I, I was really young, right? You know, I'm, I'm old enough to have been at that age, you know, that when someone Black showed up on television, you know, your parents called you in the living room um, so that you could watch the Black person that's on screen. Um, so I, I have memories of seeing Dick Gregory on television, even before I remember watching the Flip Wilson show. Um, so Dick Gregory, in, in my memory, might have been the, the first comedian that I remember seeing on, on a fairly regular basis. You know, had no idea what he was talking about, um, but knew that it was a big deal that Dick Gregory was on television. Well, I want to get you know, a little bit of history, um, mostly of his career, less of his personal life. But, mm -hmm. you know, Dick Gregory gets his start in comedy while serving in the U.S. Army, pretty much, you know, starting to tell jokes, starting to entertain folks. You you cover all of Black popular culture. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit more about the military as a training ground or as a space for Black performers to cut their teeth? You know, it, it, it was a way, you know, if you could make your army mates or your navy mates, marine mates, comfortable with you. Um, comedy was a good way to do that. Um, and, you know, because the army, at least 
post 1940s was in theory an integrated space uh, and has often been seen as as one of the quintessential institutions in terms of really promoting diversity um, in some sense, particularly amongst the rank and file. You know, it makes sense that you would have generations of black comedians like generations of black cooks or black generations of black musicians, right, who begin to cut their teeth, you know, in these military spaces. Well, you know, after he is, you know, serves in the military, he ends up going to Chicago to really start his career as a comedian. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this is the late fifth, mid to late fifties. Who are the types of comedians that are big in Chicago, but around the country at that point? And like, does he differ from them in any way or is he doing some of the same stuff? Yeah, I mean, if you think about Chicago in particular, you know, Second City is founded in 1959. Um, so you have folks like Alan Arkin who are coming through Second City. Joan Rivers comes through really early in terms of Second City. But, you know, nationally, you know, some of the most popular white comedians, right? You know, besides the folks that folks have been watching on television, like the Milton Burroughs and the, the Youngmans. But, you know, in terms of stand-up folks, you know, it, it really was like Mort Saul, um, and in particular, Lenny Bruce, in terms of the cutting age work. Um, you know, if Dick Gregory is looking at some of his counterparts in terms of Black comedians, um, the ones that stand out, and again, this is kind of past that generation of folks who were forced into Blackface, but folks like Slappy White, um, you know, someone like Nipsey Russell, right, who is still on the scene, you know, you know, <laughs> well into the 21st century, you know, enough to inspire a rapper to call himself Nipsey Hussle. Um, and, and then Timmy Rogers, I think, is a really important figure in thinking about Dick Gregory, right, because he was one of the first Black comedians that was really allowed in a suit and tie to stand there and talk to the audience. Um, for those who don't know who Timmy Rogers is, if you ever seen the film The Five Heartbeats, um, the guy who's hosting the Apollo-like uh, program, you know, who forces the Five Heartbeats to have to perform to the house band, that, in fact, is Timmy Rogers. Well, you know, he... He really makes his, I don't know, he makes a splash or he really comes to the national stage um, in Chicago when he goes on that six week run at the Playboy Club. <laughs> the Playboy Club is a really interesting space at this time. What, you know, what did it mean to be able to perform there, not just for one night, but for several weeks? Well, you know, first, it's, it's just the beginning of that run. You know, he's asked to come in. Uh, the people who have rented the room that night are, are you know, frozen food <laughs> sellers from the deep south. Um, and, you know, folks are telling him, you really don't have to go on, on stage at night. And, and what he figured out very early um, is to find a way to be able to disarm white audiences with comedy that in some ways, uh, you know, blackness was the butt of the joke, but folks weren't laughing at him, but laughing with him about the ridiculousness of some of the aspects of, of race relations, you know, in American society at the time. Um, and he's so successful that night. I, I, I want to say he went on for almost three hours um, that it was, you know, a no brainer for the Playboy Club. And, you know, Hugh Hefner is, you know, himself experimenting with a leisure space here, right? With the idea, obviously the magazine and the Playboy bunnies, uh, a place of leisure for, you know, middle-class and upper middle-class men. Um, and he was willing to push the envelope, you know, racially, right? You know, Dick Gregory, of course, is in this space. You know, Hefner becomes really good friends with Bill Cosby at some point because Cosby also is performing in this space. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a chance to do some cutting edge work um, both in terms of comedy, but also in terms of what we think about race relations socially in this country. Well, you know, it, in the documentary and in his own book, he talks about how this and the appearance on the Jack Parr show changed his finances in such a dramatic way. He's talking about like 1500 a year, then 500000 Right. Yeah. You know, every time. It seems, I mean, that's very extreme. <laughs> and the Jack Parr thing is is so important because um, it was as if there weren't Black comedians that, that had come on the Jack Parr show, right? Uh, it's that they would perform and then they would disappear. And Dick Gregory was like, if, if you're not going to allow me to sit down at the couch and talk with you, um, you know, one of the comparisons I make to, to why, for instance, you know, the Arsenio Hall show was so important, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, particularly for, like, say, the hip-hop generation, right? Because hip-hop artists would come on maybe Carson or or some of those shows, but, you know, they weren't sitting on the couch, 
to talk about their lives. Arsenio Hall opened up the couch, you know, for R&B artists and other kinds of black popular acts that would not have been able to sit in the couch, you know, on the Tonight Show. And this is part of what Dick Gregory was pushing for, you know, 40 years earlier, 30 years earlier, right? If I'm going to come to your show, treat me like a human being uh, and let me sit in that chair with your other guests and talk about, you know, other things besides my performance. And, and he, you know, he talks about it in the documentary, right? His, his money changed, right? The bag changed immediately. You know, once folks saw him sitting on that chair, on that couch, right? Everything changes for him. Well, this is a question that I have is, you know, what are the audiences looking like? Cause I, yeah, obviously we see what the audience at a Playboy club is like, um, we know that he did college gigs, but was he seated in front of black audiences often during that period or any integrated audiences? I think when you're talking about some of the television audiences, you know, majority of folks in the studio audience are white. Um, he is of this generation that, you know, he had a successful enough career that he did not have to come up the ranks of the Chitlin circuit, mm -hmm. you know, the way that some of the comedians before him did. Um, you know, in some ways, the, the Chitlin circuit is not a thing for Dick Gregory, right? Particularly early in his career when he starts making an incredible amount of money. You know, when, when he chooses to perform, when he performs for Black audiences, it's not out of necessity, right? It is a choice on his part to be able to perform to, to largely Black audiences. Well, you know, one of the things um, that I, I feel like is keeps getting uh, reiterated is um, how he and Cosby and other performers did not have to do the Chitlin circuit, basically, and how, you know, just people who were just a few years older than them, you know, had to in order mm -hmm. to survive mm -hmm. and also didn't mm -hmm. have the opportunity to get there. Um, I know that that is in some way a generational thing. Um, just that opening of opportunities. But I'm wondering if there was something specific about Dick Gregory's commentary or, or his style or any of this that lent him to sort of that big, wide space um, that, you know, obviously ended up in so much financial success. You know, I think it's the way that he used race to talk about the absurdity of black life, right? I mean, when you think about the distinctions and, and I hate to harp on, on him at this point in time, but you know, you, you can't really talk about Dick Gregory in the 1960s without talking about Bill Cosby as a counterpart. Um, and so Bill Cosby's style was to find the universal right across race and to tell stories that that resonated, you know, universally, right? So he's telling stories about being black, but black stories that resonate to white audiences. You know, Dick Gregory was using race as a way to highlight the absurdity of race relations in this country, to highlight the absurdity of the way that black people were being treated. Um, and he did so in a way that was disarming, right? You know, the best mm -hmm. comedians, right? You know, particularly political com comedians, they work because they disarm audiences, right? They make audiences, you know, more comfortable with having to deal with these truths, you know, around uncomfortable issues. And, and that was the thing that he did very well. Um, and, you know, when you see the movie, you know, he talks about the fact that um, one of the ways that, that he was able to survive these spaces and kind of the stress of it um, was to have a cigarette in his hand, right? So the cigarette mm -hmm. also connected him to the audience in a certain kind of way as a prop um, that made him feel normal on stage as he's pushing the envelope around some of these issues, you know, regarding race. Well, so it seems like uh, he differs also from some comedians in that his um his commentary or you know even just his comedy is highly visual and not that he himself no, correct, is correct. a physical comedian but that he sets images really clear images in your mind for example in the film um with the snowstorm in the south you know he's, he's a storyteller right and 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 there was a cinematic quality <laughs> you know, to the way that he told stories, right? So it made audiences, it made it easier for them, you know, to visualize what he was talking about. You know, again, he's coming after a generation of comedians who, um, you know, when you think about the man, Tan Morelands and, and, and folks like that, um, Step and Fetch it obviously being uh, Scatman Crothers, you know, part of that generation also, where part of the comedian was their comedy, right, was the bulging eyes, right, and, and, and the weird kind of facial images and, and all those kinds of things, right? He, he never had to rely on that, right? You often think about, you know, the, that Dick Gregory was 
early on doing something that we might describe as a highbrow form of comedy, right? You know, something that would get him on the couch with Jack Parr, as opposed to, you know, what we might think of as, as kind of chitlin circuit humor, right? The kind of thing that when we think about Deaf Comedy Jam, you know, in the early 20th century, right? Uh, we think about the comedy that's there, right? Which has value, right? That that serves a purpose for people who want to be able to laugh. Um, but, but, you know, Dick Gregory is always more than making people laugh. Well, yeah, that's that's my next question. Does he come out the gate as a political commentator? You know, he he is trying to find his voice. Um, and, you know, he tells a story in the film, you know, where he used to wear a hat and do these kinds of things. And, you know, he was trying to find his voice and he found his voice in what was happening politically in this country. Um, you know, as did a whole generation of, of Black artists, comedians and other folks, right? When you think about the Harry Belafonte's and and the Sidney Poitier's, when you think about Max Roach and Abby Lincoln, I mean, so many, Sam Cooke, you know, is another great example, you know, folks in which the, the the movement, the power of the movement pulled them to rethink the art that they were doing in that period of time. And he's just another great example of that, right? Someone who was committed in the work and ultimately became committed in his life, you know, to these politics that he could not turn a blind eye from, you know, in the early 1960s. Well, I have a question for you, not just about Dick Gregory, but um, as a cultural critic. And um, it's, you know, what is the difference between social observation, you know, social commentary, and then activism and com comedy? Because it seems like there may be some distinctions, overlap, some people who do one, two, three, or none. You know, could you just, could you just speak on that a bit? You know, I think about, you know, Eddie Murphy's Raw. Right, which comes out in 87. And, and he offers a really interesting commentary about African-Americans and Italian-Americans. A really funny um, observation about the tensions between Black masculinity and Italian-American masculinity, right? And so there are lots of artists, comedians, right, who do observations, right? They're funny. They make people feel as though they're in the same space, universal stories like the Cosby thing. Um, but there's another thing when you start to, in your comedy, go beyond social relations as mm -hmm. social relations and then begin to talk about social relations as power relations. So if you're Dick Gregory and you begin to talk about not just race relations, but race relations in the context of, of who holds power in this country, right? Who holds great influence? Um, when you get to the point where you can name names, if you will, um, making jokes about Richard Nixon and things like that, you know, a little later on in the 1960s, you know, that's when you're crossing a line, right? You know, it, you know, in the mainstream imagination around these things, right? And of course, for Dick Gregory, you know, for him, it, he was not satisfied just to be an activist on stage. Um, you know, there are lots of things that we expect from from artists, um, and, and not every artist is built to be on the front lines of a political movement. We, we know that from so many quote unquote musicians and artists, movie stars, and, and the kind of mistakes that they make on social media. You know, some of these folks don't need to be spokespersons for anybody's <laughs> <laughs> political movement, right? So, and for some folks like, let's, why don't you just let your art talk? <laughs> um, but Dick Gregory was not comfortable with that, right? And he was building relationships with folks who were in the movement. You know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, you know, of course, Medgar Evers. And, and so it put him in a position, you know, because of his influence and his, and his visibility, but also because of his wealth, right? That he mm -hmm. found ways to contribute to the movement beyond simply talking about it on stage. There also seems to be, a, um, from what you're saying and what was in the film, that he himself was somewhat of an organizer, like he had gone through intense political education by being around these men, um, you know, fellow activists and leaders, um, but also by going there, you know, to Mississippi, to Alabama and spending significant amounts of time. No, I mean, when you read, you know, the, the, the autobiography, when you read Nigger, um, and he talks about those first trips when Medgar Evers, you know, come down to Mississippi with me and he takes those first trips um, and he sees what's going on. Um, you know, he, he commits himself to always finding a way to make sure that the movement was part of 
his daily routine. Um, I, you know, I was struck, you know, listening again to the Kent State speech and, and the person who is uh, introducing him, you know, talks about the fact that, you know, this is someone who lives in five, five suitcases, <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, and and a garment bag, right? Because he's always going to the gig and then going from the gig to the rally and then going back to another gig and then going to a political meeting. You know, he made a decision, right, that that was mm-hmm. the kind of life that he wanted to live. And, and you know, he was as he writes about it in in the autobiography. I mean, he's conflicted about this, right, because he's just one man, right, and and he knows that you know he doesn't necessarily have the pulse of the people. His job is to serve the people. Right. And, and that's what he attempted to do throughout his you know, life and career. Well, you bring that autobiography up, which, of course, you know, what did he say? He's like, Mama, every time you hear that word, word I'm getting paid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the bag is increasing every time increasing. that work is. Um, um, and, and you think about it, man. I mean, it's radical, right, for to name a book like that, you know, in, in 1965, um, you know, before I ever read the, the autobiography, uh, my parents had a copy of uh, H. Rap Brown's Die, ding, or die in the in the house, right? And that was published sixty seven, sixty eight, and, and I was always struck by that. It's like, wow, that's a hell of a name, <laughs> you know, for you know, groundbreaking, right? It's like, oh no, Dick Gregory beat him to it by two mm-hmm. years. <laughs> well, you know, I know he had help writing that book, but mm-hmm. he published a lot of books over his lifetime. I mean, short stories, children collections. He edited black comedy anthologies. He got the diet book. I mean, there's like a lot going on there. What what do you think his relationship to the written word was? I know he read a lot, but in terms of producing in that way. It's, you know, we still live in a reading culture back then. Um, and if you wanted to have, you know, as many eyeballs as powerful as possible, right? If you wanted to be influential in many different ways, right? You had to go, you know, beyond what you do on stage, right? Because with the Gregory, it's it's the stage performance, right? It's being on television, it's recording albums, right? As another way to be able to access his work, but it's also these books, right? So, you know, whether it's the the autobiography or, you know, his book about, you know, hundreds of black facts, um, you know, he published a political primer in 1972, you know, which includes, you know, his, his speech at Kent State. Um, you know, he understood that people, there were people who would not go to clubs, who would not necessarily watch him on television or listen to his albums, but were interested in what he had to say and they would read it in a book. Um, he was a multi-platform <laughs> um, you know, brand, you know, before we talked about multi-platform brands. Right. Like so many people want to be, want to, <laughs> want do to be he now. Did. Right. Right. He did. Right. You know, could you imagine the Dick Gregory podcast? <laughs> oh my gosh. Like the Gregory Tumblr. I mean, there's a lot, you know, Dick Gregory TikTok would be a dream of mine, but um, <laughs> we talked about his relationship a little bit to Medgar Evers and all of these, um, you know, men who were doing incredible things in the South. Um, but Beyond what he felt called to do, what was he really being asked to do? In the film, it um, you know it it becomes clear that he was used kind of as an agitator. You know, a few days before King would you know have a, a major event. Could could you speak to how, let's say, King and and uh, Medgar Evers in particular um, thought he, he could serve the movement? Well, I you know you could argue that before Jesse Jackson, right, that he almost served as 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 the hype man, you know, for the civil rights movement, right? Someone who was popular enough and visible enough that everyday folks would pay attention um, to what was going on because he talked about it. Um, again, he's of this generation like Portier and Belafonte, Sammy Davis Jr., Nina Simone, so many others of Rita Franklin, you know, that, that part of their grand gesture to the movement obviously was to be able to give free concerts and free performances, you know, in which they were able to raise money that would go to SNCC or SALC, Urban League, you know, whatever the organization was. Um, but for, with Gregory, it was a step further, I think, because he was someone who was visibly connected to the movement, considered himself part and insider of the movement, if you will. Um, you know, it was simply beyond, you know, let me give my time to raise money, right? He was really in many ways um, someone who would generate interest in the visit 
in a rally, right? In a speech, right? By by being able to pay bring attention to it. Well, you know, his political interests are really all over the place and kind of, and, and you know, you would say holistic because it, you know, it, it touched every justice issue, you know? And, you know, my curiosity is about how he just kept picking up causes over time, you know, it just felt like an avalanche. It just kept going. Um, but within the civil rights movement, he supported many orgs and he seemed to be, you know, someone who may be of sort of an older, uh, you know, SNCC and, you know, all these sort of older yeah. orgs, but also someone who didn't shy away from black power. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find another historical figure who had a comfort level around King and Malcolm um, in the old guard organizations like the Urban League and the NAACP. Uh, there are very few figures who fit comfortably within those spaces. Um, and he talks about, you know, at least in his autobiography, right, having real friendships, you know, with Malcolm X, having real friendships with Medgar Evers, right, incredible friendship with Medgar Evers, having real, you know, friendships with, with Martin Luther King. Um, and I think all of those men valued having him in their lives. Mm. Um, you know, for that very reason, um, you know, I, it, 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 it's hard to, to think of another figure who was as comfortable in that role. Um, and again, you know, th there's it's it's a civil rights movement, right? It's a black power movement. Right. But there are obviously competing interests and competing institutions. You know, all of these organizations are, are fighting for the same kind of donations from different people, white and black foundations and what have you. Um, but Big Dig Gregory, because I think he was committed to something, basically human rights, right, was always willing to work with somebody in some cause that furthered, you know, the case of human rights. Well, you know, the 1968 is such a huge year for him as it is for the country. Um, but on a personal slash political level, I mean, he runs for president, <laughs> you know, on an integrated ticket with Mark Daly. Um <laughs> as his VP, there's so many instances in his life where he does things that look like a stunt, but are also quite deep in intention and do serve their purpose in terms of get, getting attention. Um, you know, he held a swearing in ceremony, for example, for himself as a president in exile under Nixon. Mm -hmm. Is this performance art? Was he doing these things in earnest? Like what is the alchemy of, of these incredibly public performances that he puts on? Well, well let me tell you what it's not. It, it's not Kanye West running for president in 2020, right? It's, <laughs> it's not that, right? It, it is, I would argue, political theater. Um, you know, one, it, it, just the absurdity of thinking that a black man can be president in 1968, right? Something that is absurd, as absurd in 1968, that for many people, it was still absurd in 2008, right? So obviously he's not thinking seriously that he can become president of the United States. But what is important is to create a platform that pushes back on the idea that the process in and of itself, regardless of political party, is corrupt, right? Because it wasn't representing the people. And the idea of identifying himself as a president in exile Right, it is another part of that process, right? That that this does not represent who we are, right? And, and and I might not be the answer, but at least I'm willing to create a platform that's an alternative to the corruption that we're seeing in Washington and other places. Um, again, it's it's less than ten years later that someone like Fela Kuti, right, essentially erects his own nation within Nigeria, you know, claiming in fact, right, that he was the president of of Kalakulata. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't imagine that given the time that Fela spent in the U.S., that he was unaware, right, of Dick mm -hmm. Gregory, you know, becoming this uh, president uh, in exile under the Nixon administration. Yeah, well, you know, his his career at the end of the 60s really becomes interesting because, you know, he's not doing as much club work mm -hmm. and he's really going on tour uh, universities, which he did till his last day. <laughs> the first time I ever saw him was at a university, you mm -hmm. know? Um, 
And I'm wondering if you could speak to how he appealed in the late 60s, specifically to a young audience, in particular a college audience. And, and I think it's important to remember that, you know, some of this is by choice for Dick Gregory. You know, Dick Gregory is choosing to give up the club scene, right? Because he yeah. recognizes he wants to do other work. Uh, and so comedy still becomes a linchpin of that work, right? But just no longer in the clubs. And college campuses, you know, in, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, right? I mean, they're all looking for truth tellers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the kind of culture war that we think that we're going through now in the U.S. in 2021. I mean, college campuses all across the country we're having these cultural wars. I mean, even at HBCUs, right? Folks who wanted to hold on to tradition and folks who are trying to break tradition, right? And, and folks, again, particularly young folks uh, who can't imagine this, but you know, we're still living at a point in time um, in college campuses in the late 60s, early 1970s, where you know there are no co-ed interactions, right? There are no co-ed dorms. Um, something happens to you on campus, at least until 1974. I mean, literally teachers can you know contact your parents to tell them that you got bad grades. I mean, it's a different kind of world, right? The way that students were socially controlled on American campuses then. And so it's not surprising that they were looking for alternative voices to kind of cut through, you know, the clutter tradition. Um, you know, Muhammad Ali, you know, when he was not able to be in the boxing ring, he sustained himself those two or three years on college campuses, right? Dick Gregory was the same. Um, you know, Malcolm X, you know, spoke at college campuses before his death. I mean, that became an important place, particularly if you were viewed as a black culture, a truth, a truth teller, right? You know, Angela Davis is another great example of this. Um, college campuses became very hospitable, you know, to that work, right? And as you mentioned, it became one of the places that Dick Gregory went to time and time again, you know, for, for the rest of his career. I mean, here at Duke, you know, one of the critical moments at, at Duke University um, was a takeover of uh, the university's um, main administration building, the Allen building. Um, and it wasn't until I started doing my own research on Dick Gregory and teaching this Dick Gregory course at Duke that I realized that Dick Gregory actually spoke to the students, came to spook at Duke, you know, two weeks before the takeover. Um, and mm -hmm. while there's no fundamental record that says they were inspired by Dick Gregory, you know, again, you know, someone who is coming in and, and literally says in this speech, take over the building, <laughs> um, you know, that these things have an impact, right? And it was important for him to be seen on these college campuses, particularly college campuses where it wasn't necessarily, you know, a contingent of black students that were there, that there mm -hmm. were white students who wanted to hear what he had to say. Well, I mean, that feels like another reason why the FBI was after him is not, you know, he's not just going to HBCUs. His influence is wider than that. It's, it's coming to the counterculture and the counterinsurgency of all young Americans. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I often find that when we think historically about some of these political figures, uh, black political activists in particular, that, that they are viewed as most dangerous when, uh, they leave the confines of, of black life. Um, you know, there's a way in which Martin Luther King was safe as long as he was talking about integrating water fountains and toilets and buses and things like that. Um, it, it's not missed to, you know, historical students that, you know, it's, it's shortly before the plan uh, poor People's Campaign, right, which would be this multiracial diverse movement um, that King gets killed. Um, I, Dick Gregory clearly was aware of those particular dynamics. Again, you know, when you read his autobiography, when you listen mm -hmm. to the Kent State speech, um, and, and he goes on and on about the reality of surveillance, right? You know, he knew what happened to King. He knew what happened to Malcolm X, Matt Grabbers. Um, he knew what this looked like, right? He knew what happened to Fred Hampton, right? And Mark Clark in Chicago, right, in, in 1969. So, so he was always aware of those threats. You know, we're speaking today uh, because Dick Gregory came to the town hall in 1971 in April. Um, and, and once again, he often came to places not as a comedian, not necessarily billed as a comedian, but of course what he said was funny. <laughs> funny. But he came um, in a series that included Ralph Nader, 
So he wasn't brought on as a comedic act. But I think the time for me is really interesting because it's April 22nd and two weeks later is the Kent State Memorial, of course, which, you know, which you can listen to on YouTube, I recommend. Um, and I'm, I once again, we, we talked a little bit about this, but his popularity and his influence on the anti-war movement and the student movements across the country, not just in the South, um, in the Black South. Can you speak a bit to that as well? You know, again, you know, using the benefit now of more than 50 years of history since Kent State, you know, there were Black students that were killed by uh, police forces at Jackson State mm -hmm. um, uh, in South Carolina the, the year before then that didn't get a lot of recognition. I think for many young people in this country, uh, when they saw four white college students killed, um, by the National Guard at Kent State, that that was a, a woe moment, right? That that clearly something was happening that, you know, quote unquote, these folks were willing to kill their kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a year later, you know, in 1971, w which is an extraordinary year for, for so many reasons, right? You know, culturally what's happening, you know, it's a year that what's going on drops, you know, uh, Gil Scott Heron releases a version the revolution will not be televised, you know, Sly and the Family Stone, you know, there's a riot going on, Shaft <laughs> is released, Sweet Suit Back to Badass song. I mean, there's so much going on culturally. And, and of course, you know, the Attica um, right. revolt in, in September of that year. Um, and so it's, there's something really fitting, obviously, about both Dick Gregory being in town hall in New York, that year, given everything that was going on, and him being one of the folks who's asked to come to Kent State to memorialize what mm -hmm. happened, right? Is there a better person that can be chosen in that moment, right? You know, is there a more visible, popular political agitator, right, who's been outspoken about the Vietnam War, you know, who's already been speaking to these young folks on campuses like Kent State's. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, he was the person, he was the voice in that moment. Um, and and I, I think there's something really important about that because, you know, he, it, you know, a year later, you know, he's speaking at Gary, Indiana, right, for the, for the National Black Political Convention. Yeah. Um, you know, wherever his energies could take him, wherever his attention could take him, um, he knew that his presence and visibility mattered. Um, and, and he made sure to do that as often as possible. And, and, and let's be honest, you know, because of his success in television and, and, you know, in clubs in the early and mid 1960s, you know, he had enough wealth, right? You know, that he had that huge, you know, bit of land up in Massachusetts where he's raising, you know, his, yeah. you know, double digit children. <laughs> um, you know, he, he had wealth to be able to take care of his family. And at the same time, you know, he felt a real strong commitment to give back, right? Both monetarily, but obviously his time also. You know, it's it's interesting. You you bring up the Gary Political Co Convention, which obviously had like all of the luminaries. All, you know, so many artists. You know, I was speaking to Sonia Sanchez, and she was like, "Oh yeah, I missed it." And it was some like small thing, but you know, it's like everybody else was there. Um, and it it gets me to thinking about how generally in the culture at that point there was a lot of political education amongst very well known artists. So, you know, of course, in that case, we're talking like James Brown and Harry Belafonte were at the Gary um, Black Political Co Convention. But so many artists are speaking up about the war in particular across yeah. American media. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. I just thought about this in this moment. You know, I don't think I've ever heard or read anything about, you know, Marvin Gaye referencing you know, Dick Gregory. Um, but when you just think about the, the shift in the facial hair on Marvin Gaye's face, mm. right? He looks like Dick Gregory. Because, um, mm. um, you know, it, yeah. it just, and, and this is at this time, obviously, when, when Gregory himself is bearded, you, you know, he is someone, you know, he was never a nationalist, you know, in that sense. Um, always, you know, down for the black cause, right? but you know, someone who was more about human rights. Um, but people were paying attention to him, 
right? All mm -hmm. the artists were listening to him. They knew his comedy. They had read his books. Um, he was their idea of what a serious artist could be, right? Both in terms of the content of his comedy, but also his political convictions. Um, and, you know, and, and he wanted to make sure more than anything that he acted a life that spoke to those political convention, convictions, right? So even when he wasn't the most well-known comedian, you know, in the country, um, mm -hmm. black or white, right? Even when, you know, he could not probably sell out a club, mm -hmm. right? You know, he knew that he still had a platform in which his political con convictions would, you know, market as something that was critical and important. Um, thank you. This actually is an image, uh, or that was an image of, a cast of, I mean, look at some of these people. It's Jane Fonda, Donald Sutherland, <laughs> Peter Boyle, Dick Gregory, Barbara Dane. I mean, just huge stars who are, right. you know, in a cast for a production called F the Army. <laughs> and this is at the Haymarket Square, you know, coffee house. So there just seems to be such incredible political activity around this time. And this is, I think, 71. Um, were very, very popular. I mean, these are some of the most popular entertainers in the world at this point yeah. are taking part. I mean, do you see, I hate to always compare now to then, so I won't do that, but do you see <laughs> in you know generations beyond that, like who would, what other moments would you say that artists of this caliber, of this fame um, took risks together? Because this is obviously about anti, you know, anti-war. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I think about the coalition of artists who came together around the King holiday. Mm. Um, Gil Scott Heron, Dick Gregory, <laughs> Stevie Wonder, most famously. Um, you know, at a period in time in which you know that for all that we, all the ways we describe Martin Luther King now, he was still viewed in many circles as a communist agitator. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Mark, you know, Ronald Reagan essentially shades him as that as he's signing the bill, you know, in yeah. 1983 for the holiday eventually in 1986. Um, that's one good example. The best example, of course, in the U.S. over the last 50 years is, is uh, South African apartheid. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's folks who were unwilling to perform there, unwilling to perform in Sun City, you know, protesting various consulates um, about uh, folks divesting from South Africa. Um, the Dick Gregory that I came to know as a college student, you know, when I refigure out who this man is, uh, I, I don't know much at that time, you know, in the mid 80s about, you know, his relationships with King and all those kind of folks. What I do know, right, is if there were protests about South Africa apartheid, right, that's where I saw Dick Gregory. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and in some ways, he was probably the most consistent black figure, entertainer, at least, that I saw in those spaces. Well, I want to um, we're getting into the 80s. And I think something that runs through his life from the 70s on is the way that he treated his body. And I think we can say certain things just about the risk that any person takes going into the movement, especially when so much of the movement was at that point predicated on violence towards black people yeah. um, as a means for um, advancement or at least advancing a cause, the the um, the pro proliferation of those images in particular. Um, but on another level, there's the fasting, there's the intense running. There's, there's something about his relationship to his body that I, I find really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, let's start with the running thing, right? He, of course, was a track star in high school and college, right? Got a scholarship to go to college to run track. Um, and, and in the film, you know, his children talk about the fact that, you know, when they were very young, you know, he forced them to run because for him, there was something rejuvenating about running, about the pounding, about, you know, blood circulating through your body. For him, running was always a go-to right, in periods of stress and strain and all those things. Um, so it's not surprising, right, that, that he would integrate um, running into his activist activities, his protest activities in the 70s and the 80s. Um, but when you talk about his body, right, and again, it's really striking, right, it's, it's almost like, you know, folks who 
grew up looking at Michael Jackson when he was in the Jackson five and then looking at Michael Jackson again, you know, in 2005, and they're like, how is that the same person? Um, when you see the images, right, of Dick Gregory, 62, 63, um, you know, he's still heavy set, right? He doesn't have a beard, he does have a mustache. And I mean, it's a radical transformation, you know, in a four or five year period to, to how he looks, right? That almost gaunt-like, you know, quality to him that he carries on really for the rest of his life. And, and for him, again, to talk about his personal investment in politics, right? The fasting, right, was a personal investment. Right, you know, it, there, there was something about it that's that's almost uh, uh, devout, you know, in the way that he would use fast, fasting as a way to articulate his convictions around various political issues, um, joining other groups of folks who were fasting around political issues. Um, it, in many ways, is not surprising, right? You know, for for black folks historically, um, even under enslavement, right? You know, the one thing they could control is their body. Right, what they wore in their bodies, how they walked, uh, their gestures, their movement, right? That, that was all Black folks claiming, right, control over their body, right? And fasting was his choice, right, in terms of using his body, right? The same way, you know, folks on the front line of the civil rights marchers, right, mm -hmm. used their bodies knowing there were German shepherds and police batons and, and all these things that are facing them, right? They, they, you know, were willing to sacrifice their bodies in the name of their politics, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing for Dick Gregory in terms of the choice of fasting. Well, the fasting and this sort of ascetic uh, form of protest uh, does seem to move into another area in the 80s where he's like a health, uh, I don't even know what to call it, pi pioneer, you know, like, so that's not surprising to us now. Like everybody seems to have a health brand now if they have any modicum of fame, but he was really one of the first to do it. And this is in the 80s. I mean, it's him. And once again, another major activist, Jane Fonda, who are really yeah. on some other stuff when it comes to the it, 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 it makes you wonder if folks at like Slim Fast and Smoothie King were just kind of <laughs> quietly watching how successful Jane Fonda and Dick, and Dick Gregory were, you know, Dick Gregory with his uh, with his powdered Bahamian diet. Right. They would say, you know what, that that's a market that we might be able to get into. Right. And again, you know, Dick Gregory, you know, he understood his brand. Um, he understood the value of his platforms, right? He understand the importance of sustainability financially. Um, I, I have no idea how much money he made off of that, right? But, but you know, it was also linking his activism and his politics to making fundamental lifestyle choices in the lives that people live, right? Mm -hmm. You can live a better life, mm -hmm. right? You can better engage the struggle if you, in fact, are healthier. Right. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a whole conversation. Right. When you think about Martin Luther King as a chain smoker. Right. And, and you know, folks hate when you hear things like this. You know, I, he was a chain smoker. Right. The smoking was going to catch up with him. Right. If, if something mm -hmm. else didn't catch up to him. Right. And then Gregory's like, you know, I, you know, you need to be as committed to taking care of yourself if you're going to be in this struggle as you are to the politics of the struggle. Right. And he found a way to build a platform and a brand, you know, out of that. Well, it's very interesting. You know, he made um, he created a brand out of it. Right. He made money off of it, although, the, you know, there's a lot of complications with that. Yeah. Um, when you th when I think about a lot of the sort of greats of that era who lived very long, they were very, very, very open about their relationship to food. And of course, Cicely Tyson, mm -hmm. you know, just passed vegan, very open about that. Eartha Kitt living well into her 80s. Also, you know, always talking about her garden, her vegetables. You know, also, these are all people who take space, who have spaces outside of major cities, you know, sometimes ranches, mm -hmm. who have a different relationship, not only to land, but also of nourishment. And, you know, it makes me think, you know, just hearing you speak makes me think about, you um, food and land and the relationship of black folks to both over time, land that you can cultivate and keep. And it makes me think of like the famous houses that some black folk ha have, you know? And so, yeah, thinking about this home, thinking about Lucille Clifton's famous home, thinking about all of these spaces that are meant to be nourishing for a family or for a community. 
um, that also have very, very specific ties to food. Oh, absolutely. Right. You know, I'm not sure Dick Gregory ever used the term sustainability, but, you know, that that's one of the words that I think best describes his career and his politics and, and his life, um, an ongoing commitment to sustainability. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have land, that's one of the best ways to do it. I mean, you hear stories you know, from his children, um, I'm thinking in particular conversation I've had with, with Christian about how important that land space was for folks who needed some time away, mm -hmm. you know, who would find themselves, right, you know, at Dick Gregory's estate, right, just to take some time away from everything that was going on. You know, when folks thought Chappelle was crazy, right, well, what's this, he quit his show and he went to South Africa, it's like, what's that about? And it's like, no, he's pulling away from the madness, right, that that he stuck into, right, and in order to save himself, he had to extricate himself from that reality. You know, these are things that Dick Gregory had been telling his peers, um, you know, for a long time, right? Build something of your own, right? That allows you to break away from the madness when you need to get away from the madness, right? When, when they're no longer interested in you to the extent that you, they're interested in you now, you need to have a place where you can go back and feel free and feel liberated and be able to feel able to, could, you know, create as you will. Um, I give Kanye a lot of credit for whatever that space is in Wyoming that he has, right? Because clearly he understands that also, you know, even in this context. Well, um, you bring up Chappelle. <clears throat> and when I think about Dick Gregory in the 80s, of course, I think about the sustained activism, mm -hmm. um, especially the anti-apartheid activism, the focus on food, food security around the world, but also health in the U.S. Um, I mean, <laughs> the epidemic, the obesity epidemic is like right on the tails yeah. of the 80s. Right. Um, but also there are a group of comedians, even if he's not performing a lot, there are a group of comedians who are clearly referencing him and to whom he is very important that are coming out in that period. Can you speak a bit about the that crop of, huge crop of 80s stand-ups um, stand up performers who, you know, are borrowing from Dick Gregory. They will all obviously immediately mention um, Richard Pryor, right, mm -hmm. as, as a great influence. But Richard Pryor becomes Richard Pryor in part because of Dick Gregory. Um, you know, when Richard Pryor was still in his Bill Cosby bag, right, you go back and you could see video of him in a suit and tie telling Cosby like jokes. Um, when 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 he was still in that bag, right? You know, Dick Gregory gave him an alternative way to exist. Uh, so that when you listen to early Richard Pryor, really, you know, up until Bicentennial Nigger, um, <laughs> it, there's something really Dick Gregory-like about what he's doing, except he's taking it in terms of language and other things, you know, far beyond that, right? So in many ways, when you hear these generation of folks who come from in the 80s and, and they're talking about Richard Pryor, they're also talking about Dick Gregory, even if they don't directly acknowledge him. Right? But of course, when you think about folks who are willing to do more political stuff, right? Less Eddie Murphy. But when you think about Chris Rock, right? There's no question, right? Chris Rock owes a huge debt, right? To, to Dick Gregory's career. Dave Chappelle, absolutely, right? Early Dave Chappelle and the Dave Chappelle that we know now. Um, you know, when you, again, you go back to last summer and you listen to his 846 performance, his Netflix special. Um, and, and it's an interesting moment where, you know, he's talking about the pressure that folks are putting on him you know, asking him, you know, what are black folks to do? And he's really pushing back against that, right? And and part of it is this moment of him looking back at the career of someone like Dick Gregory, who didn't push back against that. And, and Chappelle, I think, is making an argument in that moment that that's not quite the life that he wants, right? He mm -hmm. wants to be able to tell political stories, right? But, but he might not be as willing to make that next step. I mean, Dick Gregory is still unique in that regard and his willingness Right to to ultimately give up a, a career of great fame and fortune um, to commit himself to these political issues that you know were important to him, and however influential he's been on now for two generations of comedians, eighties up until now, um, I don't think we see any figures that are willing to make that kind of sacrifice. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, 
when I think about the influence he's had, particularly on my generation, which starts in, you know, <laughs> it's like, so many of us, I think, came to know him through, you know, random roles in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I can't cite that this is the first time I saw him, but it might be the, you know, the um, Martin Lawrence First Amendment stand up specials. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there is there is sort of a second wave, it feels like, that happens at least in the early 2000s with him being on TV, Reno 911, all these kinds of guest yeah, appearances. Right, the, uh, yeah. the, other, the other big thing about Dick Gregory over this last uh, 10 or 15 years, well, 10 years really, is YouTube. Yes. Um, there is so much footage of of Dick Gregory on YouTube, right? And, and and I'm conflicted about how to think about that, right? Because, yeah. um, you know, Christian has talked about this, you know, he would have a conversation in a Whole Foods with anybody who wanted to have a conversation. <laughs> if you put a mic and a camera in front of Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory was gonna talk and we're gonna tell you what was on his mind. And, and it's real easy to think about Dick Gregory then as, as the crazy old man, right? Mm -hmm. In front of the camera on YouTube. But there are many ways in which everything that he says in those videos are things that Black people have thought, but would never dare to say out loud publicly. Mm -hmm. right? so, so it's like his, his last gift to us is that he was going to say publicly the things that we were never. He was going to talk about Ben Carson in ways that we were <laughs> always going to be uncomfortable about Ben Carson because, you know, he was a Black surgeon, right? He was famous. We wanted to, you know, give him love and not show shade, right, until he became part of a different administration. You know, the, you know, the cards are off the table, right? And, and it's a, it's a well-earned freedom, I would say, in this regard, right? Because he has served... Um, in his lifetime as as the griot, right? As as mm -hmm. the soothsayer, right? Willing to go into the darkness of what this experience is and to talk about it. And on the other side of that, he he has earned the right to be able to share his truths, you know, whether or not they are absurd to us or not. Right. And, right. and again, there's so few people who have had the longevity in terms of black public life and the visibility and made the sacrifices, right? To be able to be willing, you know, to be able to do that. Well, it brings um, to mind, I forget the name of the series, but I think it was Icon or Iconoclast where uh, a younger artist would um, choose, I think an elder to speak to over the course of whatever the taping was. It ended up being, I think an hour program, half an hour. And, you know, Alicia Keys chose uh, Ruby D and Dave Chappelle chose Maya Angelou. And one of the questions I remember uh, that felt actually very tender and sweet from him was, they killed all of your friends. How are you not angry? And um, it makes me think of, of Dick Gregory. He out-survived his peers. Yeah. And even some of the people who were younger than him, he, out, you know, he lived longer than Richard Pryor. I, I wonder, um, and he talks a little bit about this in, in the biography, right? You know, the, the the profound guilt of not having been standing there with Medgar Evers, uh, having been forced to go home for a sick child um, that doesn't survive, um, you know, as, as if this this child um, knew, you know, that he, he that he had a greater goal on this earth and he gets pulled home. Um, and I think for him, I, I don't want to say, well, it's it's survivor's guilt, right? I, I think his political passion really becomes focused in that moment because of, you know, Medgar gave his life for this. Um, the least I can do is, is to give back to the movement, right? And I think he felt that way about all the folks that he lost along the way, right? You know, Medgar in 63, you know, Malcolm 65, you know, Langston Hughes dies in 67, you know, Nina, uh, you know, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, right, 63. I, I mean, it's, it, it's a moment, right? And then of course, King and Bobby Kennedy and all these kind of folks, right? Uh, you know, I think sometimes we don't think about the gravity of the losses, mm -hmm. that period between really like 62 to 71, you know, the, the number of folks who are losing their lives mm 
right? You know, tangentially to the struggle or because of the struggle and the folks who survived that, right? You know, who continued to go on and, and Dick Gregory lived a long, fruitful and productive life. And, and I'm sure he carried all of those losses with him um, throughout his life. You know, um, we had just touched a little bit on the 72 Black political convention or Black national convention, I forget which, in, in Gary, Indiana. Um, something, well, first of all, the documentary, I think is still on Criterion. Mm -hmm. They Criterion, released it. Yeah. There. yeah. Uh, so anybody who has the channel or just wants to get the trial and watch it, and then mm -hmm. <laughs> do what you will. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting film, obviously a document of a, a really uh, important political moment, um, but there's so much charisma on stage. You know, it's like Dick Gregory almost doesn't stand out in that space because everybody getting up there <laughs> is, you know, it's Harry Belafonte, it's uh, James Brown, it's, it's Bobby Steele, right. it's Baraka is, <laughs> you know, leading the whole thing. So, you know, well, he's Dick Gregory, but he's among titans. Yeah. And it makes me think of, I think, a touch point for uh, definitely me and a lot of my peers was, I think it was in 2008, the State of the Black Union, when he's up there on stage with Hillary Clinton, I think Cornel West might be there. Um, that video we watched over and over and over again. This is the early days of YouTube, over and over and over again, because he his charisma just blows everyone out of the water. Right. And it's a com it feels like a, a completely different stage that he's on, a more corporate stage. You know, obviously, this is a different kind of um, convention. But can you speak to that, like who he was in the context of his peers and then who he is in 2008 on that stage? I, I think he understood in 1972 that that he's one of many who've made a commitment to this movement. Right. And again, this is knowing, you know, at this point in his career, um, about the losses, right? Knowing how incredible a figure Malcolm X was, knowing how incredible a figure um, uh, Martin Luther King was, knowing how incredible a figure Medgar Evers was and was going to be. Um, I think those relationships humble him in this space where there's so many of those figures. By the time you see him later, right? You know, he, he's an elder statesman. Um, who's learned from the losses, who's watched the losses, who, who's watched the rhythms of the movement change, you know, over the course of 30 and 40 years. And, and he knows it's a moment where, you know, he has to push forward who he is in the world, you know, because he's not going to be here for a long period of time, right? So, so his charisma has to dominate those stages, Right, in order to be able to tell stories that only he can tell that have to be told in that moment. Well, you know, it, it's, it shows up in the documentary and you spoke about it um, just a few minutes ago, but his humor is, can be very angry towards the end. And it's still funny, but it can be very bitter. angry, yeah, yeah. a little bitter, and sometimes accusatory towards the, you know, the, the interviewer, especially if the interviewer is younger. <laughs> and, you know, something that I've seen online um, when folks, especially in entertainment, uh, say, or, you know, just kind of hawk me a liberal ideology and all this stuff is, you know, it's like, if Dick Gregory were here, he would eat you up, you know, just this idea that to other, to younger generations, it's like, there's a, a fear and a deep respect and almost um, you like want to see him do it. You know, you want to yeah. see this elder statesman go off because he can, but also because he's smarter than everybody <laughs> in the room and because he'll do it and be funny. You like want to see this. It's like this weird desire. Yeah. Uh, you know, journalism has changed a great deal over the last 50 years, right? And, and there's a way in which Dick Gregory could sit down with a journalist who he absolutely disagreed with, but a journalist that he knows has read his work, who has listened to his jokes, um, will take seriously argument. Um, I think mm -hmm. far too often towards the end of his life, 
a lot of these YouTube things. And I think that's part of the reason why he just goes off right. <laughs> is that the quality of the interviewer, right? It's not yes. up the task to address the incredible amount of information that he can present to them, right? And again, mm -hmm. it, it's different, again, when you think about that 72 moment, right? Um, I often think about, when you think about Dick Gregory's relationship to those Titans in 72, I often think about, it in terms of someone like Harry Belafonte, right? Who, again, it's absolutely amazing that he's in the Dick Gregory, you know, movie, talking about someone who's been a survivor. But we think about, you know, Harry Belafonte now, it's like ground zero, right, for what it means to be a political artist and activist, you know, in the 20th century. But for Harry Belafonte, it's Paul Robeson. <laughs> Right. right. And in, and in Belafonte's head, right, whoever he is, he's always doing that. Right. In deference to Robeson. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's the same thing with Dick Gregory. Right. But but to do it in deference to someone that the people who are talking to you don't know who those folks are. Right. That's when. Yeah. Right. It, it can be a little frustrating. No, you can even see it. And I really do recommend everybody watch the documentary. But you can just see from these once again, like titans of the entertainment industry, Jack Parr and other interviewers, that there was a care and also an intellect right. taken in, right. Right. into consideration when even crafting questions and engaging with, right. you know, Merv Griffin even, you know, just a, a sort of care. I, um, I mean, I mean, that's why so many black radicals and, and leftists love talking with William Buckley. Right. They absolutely despise his politics. Right. But there was a level of intellect and respect for the intellect. Right. That they knew that conversation would be worth their time. The David Suskinds and, and, and people like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I feel like I have seen him with Tavis Smiley um, more than any other yeah. sort of like younger um, interviewer or, per, you know, talk show host. And it's like, yeah, at at this point or at that point in um, American media culture, who else could really handle, handle him but right, somebody right. on PBS? Yes, right. Absolutely. You know, that may have been on NBC in the 60s, but it's got to be on PBS yeah, now. Absolutely. You know, I always thought it was interesting, you know, CBS this morning um, did a profile of Dick Gregory shortly before his death. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a whole piece about him, you know, going back on the road and hitting the clubs and things like that again. And, and it was really telling to me that finally mainstream media was in a place where they could comfortably, you know, deal with Dick Gregory as the intellectual and the thinker mm -hmm. um, that he really was. Um, you know, of course, putting him in this kind of tradition of Mark Twain, right, as a way, as a signaler of who he'd become in the world. Right? And, and I thought it was fairly ironic that, you know, when they finally get around to that, you know, literally two weeks later, you know, he's dead. Yeah, <laughs> that that happens often, I feel. Last leg. Um, we have some questions and comments from the mm -hmm. audience that I want to get over to you. Helen Wheelock, Dr. Neal, What's something that you learned about Gregory that confounded you? <laughs> well, I, I heard at least one story of Dick Gregory and Michael Jackson uh, and one of Michael Jackson's creatures. <laughs> and, and I won't repeat the story. Um, but um, it, it, it showed me that Dick Gregory, uh, more than anything, was human and, and reacted the way any other human being might have reacted going into someone's home and, and being confronted with a creature that people normally don't have in their home. It's <laughs> <That's> pretty funny. <laughs> um, Michael Ward comments, Dick Gregory spoke at Bates College. He urged the audience to send their crushed pack of cigarettes back to the tobacco companies to end the Vietnam War. Uh, Gregory suggested economic boycott as political power. Um, I would actually be interested, if you wouldn't mind, a follow-up to that. Um, mm -hmm. What was his relationship to economic boycotts and also entrepreneurship? Because it did seem like he had his eye on money in an interesting way, um, not necessarily always his own. but Yeah. You no, know, I think, you know, it, it's in the toolkit of his generation of activists, um, obviously, most famously. Um, with the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, but, you know, strategic boycotts, I think, were really important 
to him and other folks that generation to be able, first of all, to send a statement, right? But also to try to actually damage the economic bottom line, you know, for companies that were exploiting people and things, um, you know, the best way to get at them is obviously through the stream of money. And I always found it was interesting, um, the faith, uh, that Dick Gregory put in his wife, mm. right, to, to manage the money, right, that, that, that he knew that wasn't his strength <laughs> um, and, and placed that under her control um, and at least understood enough to invest in his own brand without it feeling as though it was exploited exploitive or that he was selling out, right? And, yeah. and that's a difficult and a fine line, right? You know, um, there should be some way in which you can at least invest in your image and your visibility as a political person, right? To be able to take care of your family and, and other folks of that nature. And, and it, but it's always a fine line, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's often hard to judge people who come from nothing, right? I mean, that's that's, you know, Dick Gregory's generation is, is a great example of this. It's really hard to judge people who literally come from eating cold beans out of cans, right, and, and scraps of bread, you know, what they choose to do with their money, right, when they actually finally become financially stable or, or even wealthy in the case of Dick Gregory. Um, and I give him a lot of credit, you know, for making those kinds of, of investments in land, um, in the idea of sustainability, right? And opening up the space for other people to be able to both um, listen, to have counsel, his counsel in terms of how they can do that for themselves, mm -hmm. um, but also to literally, you know, be able to take advantage of the space in the case of the, you know, the huge land in Massachusetts. Thank you. We have another, Idris Syed asks, can Dr. Neal discuss Dick Gregory's continued commitment to K Kent State e.g. Tent City 1977 and 2015, uh, 2015 speeches at the commemoration? You know, I think it's important because K Kent State goes further in our rear view. Um, and for instance, when you talk to young students on the college campuses now, um, the, the, for the most part, they don't appreciate the gravity of what happened at Kent State, mm -hmm. um, what it meant for the future of American universities, right? What it meant to be a college student who pushed back. Um, you know, there's a way in which, you know, really up until the 1980s with the generation of college students who were pushing back against South Africa and apartheid, um, there was a political uh, energy that we saw continuously from college campuses that I would argue has dissipated mm -hmm. since the mid 1980s, right? As colleges and universities themselves have become more corporate and have been more invested in producing corporatized students, right? Who are already thinking about MBAs and MDs and law degrees when they literally walk on campus for the first time um, and are not willing to stray away from that right, in order to engage in political activism and things of that nature. Um, you know, Dick Gregory's commitment to Kent State and to give those speeches that he continuously did in those reference points was a reminder of how important those kind of commitments were. And, and if you are 19, 20, and 21 years old, and you don't have the time and the energy to sacrifice for political movement, right, that's not going to happen with a mortgage and car notes and child care expenses and, and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's an offshoot of that, I'm thinking about his commitment, obviously, to to end state terror, police terror um, over time and his involvement, particularly um, in sort of the, for, the aftermath of uh, Mike Brown's yeah. killing. Um, I, could you speak to his relationship to young activists, especially as Black Lives Matter gained steam, you know, five, six years ago? You know, he does an interview in September of 65, shortly after, after Watts. Um, and he talks about police brutality. And, and I remember posting copies of that speech on social media in, in 2015 to talk about the long arc of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when Black Lives Matter happens, right, you know, Dick Gregory, of course, understands that to the extent that people want to have him involved, that he needed to be involved. 
Um, and I think for the most part, the activists were respectful of his presence, right? But, you know, one of the things that marked Black Lives Matter, right, is, is this idea that it was a new movement, new version of leadership, right? All of that, all of which was legitimate. Um, so I'm not sure how effective his presence was in that particular moment in ways that I think might have been a little different had it been 20 or 30 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Right, because because uh, again, I mean, um, for so many young folks, by the time we get to 2015, 16, you know, Dick Gregory is a guy on the YouTube videos and a dude who you know sold a powdered vegan drink, right? Mm -hmm. All that other previous history, and clearly, you know, things like his relationship with Medgar Evers. Um, it's not like I ever learned anything about Dick Gregory in a classroom, <laughs> you, right. know, you know, high school or or collegiate. And, you know, he died, I don't want to mess this up, I think in 2017. Right, July 2017, yep. Um, last, the last year was really a time that I felt young Black people, young activists were looking to the past. You know, Angela Davis is all the rage again, yeah, you know, right. and James, I mean, James Baldwin. wasn't obsessed with James Baldwin already. It's coming out again. People are looking at Tony K. Bambara. There's just sort of a a reflourishing sure. um, of attention is specifically to the seventies and black power movement um, and the art that came out of that period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to do something, you know, imaginative here. <laughs> what do you think his physical presence could have been to this movement last year? Dick Gregory had talked profoundly and cynically and politically about every American president, you know, since he spoke about Kennedy and Johnson in the early 1960s. Um, I would have loved to have been able to see Dick Gregory's critiques of the last administration had he still been alive. Mm. Um, I would have loved to have been able to see him galvanize uh, multi-generations of black and white folks um, to talk about the importance of, of going to the polls, right? And, and not just, you know, because Dick Gregory was not someone who was uh, committed to one party or the other, right? He was as openly critical of the Democrats as he was the Republicans, right? Which is why his presidential campaign was was independent. Um, but I always thought he talked about those things in a way um, he talked about in his own speeches, right? Uh, uh, what we think of now as voting for a politics of, of, of the least evil. Um, and, and it's still relevant, right? And I think he would have been there to galvanize that. Again, to think about how Dick Gregory would have existed in this moment with access to new technology, right? You know, what what would a Dick Gregory Twitter feed look like <laughs> <laughs> on, any, on any given day, right? I don't think he would have messed with TikTok. Um, you know, he, he might have showed up on Instagram because of younger folks in his life. But, you know, to, for him to be able to be able to have a phone in his hand to be able to go on Twitter, um, to literally have been able to speak back to an American president directly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would have loved to be able to see that. <laughs> I know it could have been him and Dionne Warwick, you know, representing <laughs> <laughs> for the octogenarians. Um, we have one more question uh, from Nina Bradley. Can Dr. Neal speak a bit more about uh, Dick Gregory's relationship to his wife and family and his balance of that with his comedy career and activism. Let me tell you, um, Lillian Gregory um, might be the biggest hero in this story. You're leaving me home with 10 kids? <laughs> and, and you're where? You're San Francisco tonight in some place in Idaho tomorrow night and then I, it, it's just the sacrifice that she had to make, right? Not having a regular partner there 
right, to, to manage the domestic realities, right? I, you know, I have two adult daughters now when they weren't adults and I left for a three-day conference, right? I, I caught hell. <laughs> right. Imagine if you did Gregory, right? And like you got 10 kids at home and you got arrested where? <laughs> right. And so now we got to figure out how to get you out of jail. And, and I mean, it's it's an incredible sacrifice, right? But you know, the talking to folks like Christian, you know, he did talk about, you know, he was committed that when he was home, he was home. Right, that that he was involved in the daily lives of the kids, right? You know, that that he understood the importance of what it meant to sacrifice himself to the world, but also to make sure that sacrifice wasn't a sacrifice that his family also had to sacrifice by not having him around. Um, and the longevity of his relationship, his marriage with Lillian, um, how successful all the kids are, right, in terms of graduate degrees and, and professional lives and all these kinds of things. Um, you know, it, it really is a model for folks trying to find that sweet spot, that balance between what it actually really does mean to be famous. Mm. Right. You know, at, you know, there are people who are almost famous and sort of famous and, you know, internet famous. I mean, Dick Gregory for a period of time in the 1960s and the 1970s was as legit famous as you could be you know, for someone who was Dick Gregory, um, you know, it's it's a model for people to be able to manage that level of popularity and visibility with a continued commitment to, to your family. Well, thank you so much for answering that. That's it for questions. I have a question for you, <laughs> which is, is there a favorite joke or stand-up special or something artistic that he did that you'd like to share with us? So, uh, you know, it's, it's an offbeat example, but there was an R&B singer by the name of Tayshawn. Um, and he did a song and a music video in 1989 for a song that's just called Black Man. Um, and the thing that always caught my attention in that video is like he has a group of like 10, 11 people always behind him performing. And Dick Gregory was one of the folks that were there. <laughs> um, and, and it's, so it's like, you know, there, there is when you when you think about Dick Gregory's life, that there is this Forrest Gump quality that, you know, if, if there was a major protest happening someplace in the U.S. and even sometimes around the world, you can kind of expect that somewhere in there, Dick Gregory <laughs> it is someplace <laughs> around. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I have a question about you now, which is, what are you working on now? What can we look forward to? Uh, my new book, Black Ephemera, uh, The Challenge and Crisis of the Musical Archive will be released in the first wow. quarter of 2022. Um, so that's the, the most exciting thing for me uh, at the moment in terms of what I've been doing. Um, I've been thankful for the last uh, three years um, with support from the Ginny Kaborchian uh, Foundation to be able to teach here at Duke a Dick Gregory in the History of Comedy class. Um, we've done two iterations. Uh, we'll do a third iteration when I return from sabbatical in the fall of 22. Um, so I've been really excited about that. We've had the opportunity to show films, um, to bring in comics like Marshall Warfield, for example, wow. and Kim Coles. Um, um, and, and Marshall Warfield was fantastic um, because she talked about how influential, as someone who came from Chicago, you know, how influential a figure like Dick Gregory was, you know, on her career. Oh, I can't wait for that. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. It's always a joy to talk about Dick Gregory, who I, I feel yes. like has touched us all in such different <laughs> ways. <laughs> um, no, I, I thank you so much for joining us. It's such a special, such a special treat to have you here. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed being here. <laughs> thank you. Well, before we head off, I just want to say thank you to the town hall team that made this program possible. Uh, we've got Alex, our producer on the back end, and Jeff, who's also a part of our production team. Uh, we do this together as a team. So thank you to everyone at the town hall who works here, uh, the board, and of course, you for joining us. 
Please join us next week. We will be talking um, to Ben Yagoda about the great Will Rogers, another foundational comedian and comic artist in American history. So come back next week at 7 p.m., same time, same place, Tuesday, (laughs) Um, here on our platform on YouTube. Please sign up for notifications, sign up for our newsletter to hear more. To support the town hall and programs like these, please visit thetownhall.org backslash donate. Um, Have a great night, and I really encourage you to stay on YouTube tonight and just search De Gregory Stand Up, De Gregory Interviews, and definitely the Kent State uh, recording, which is definitely be able to listen to, to, to it today. So thank you so much. Head to Showtime to watch the documentary and have a great night.